Hello friends, this video on photosynthesis in higher plants part 15 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So let us now talk about NADPH synthesis. So how NADPH synthesis occurs? So here we will now talk about the PS1 as well. Till now we were only talking about PS2. So now let us see what happens when the electron reaches PS1 from the electron transport system. Now when I said that light falls on PS2, it actually falls simultaneously on both PS2 as well as PS1. Now whatever is in black and white that we have already discussed. Whatever is in colored that we are going to discuss now. So till this part we already know that from PS1 electron got excited, it passes through electron transport chain and finally Finally, the low energy electron reaches PS1. Correct? You remember I told here the electron had high energy. So here it was high energy electron. But by the time it reached PS1, it became a low energy electron. But since the sunlight is also falling on PS1, so this low energy electron also gets excited. How? Because PS1 also has a reaction center with the chlorophyll A P700 which is good at absorbing the 700 nanometer wavelength of light. 700 nanometer wavelength of blue light actually. So, it, so this will absorb, the, so when light falls on both PS2 and PS1 simultaneously, PS2 will absorb the 680 nanometer wavelength and PS1 will absorb the 700 nanometer wavelength. So see, it absorbs even greater wavelength so that greater energy can be uh, obtained here. Now the electron which reached PS1 has low energy, but because of the energy absorbed from this light, this low energy electrons also get excited. They get lot of energy and they also get excited. And what happens when the electron get excited? As usual, the electron will move to higher energy levels and then the electron will be picked up by an electron acceptor. The similar process which happened in case of PS2. So here also electrons will get excited and it will be picked up by a primary acceptor or a primary electron acceptor. So this primary electron acceptor is FES that is iron sulfide. So now once it reaches there, then what happens? to this electron. So now what happens once the electron reaches the electron acceptor that is FES. So again the same process will take place so from here it will pass on to many other electron carriers. So let us see where it passes to. So from here the electron will pass to another molecule called ferredoxin which is again another important electron carrier. From ferredoxin it passes on to a molecule which is very rich in energy which is NADP plus that is nicotinamide diphosphate. So it reaches this molecule which is extremely high in energy. So this here when it reaches this uh, molecule there is an enzyme called NADP plus reductase. So what does this enzyme do? As soon as the electron reaches NADP+, NADP reductase activates and this donates electron to NADP+. So this enzyme will donate electron to NADP+, and as a result, NADPH will be formed. So this NADPH which is formed is again released to the stroma and is utilized for the dark reaction. So what is the reaction that takes place? NADP plus when it gets the electron it forms NADPH and this is how the synthesis of NADPH takes place. So what happens? Here as light falls into it the low energy electrons gain sufficient energy it gets excited it is picked up by the electron acceptor FES. From there it moves on to ferredoxin. From ferredoxin it goes to NADP+. So NADP+, accepts this electron and it becomes NADPH. The enzyme which helps in this conversion is NADP reductase. 
So that is a simple process, not too much of complication. So this is how NADPH synthesis occurs. Now for information, this NADPH again is a very high, is a very energy rich molecule. One NADPH is capable of producing three ATP molecules. And what is NADPH? This is nicotinamide dinucleotide. So this was all about the process of non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Now before we start our discussion on cyclic photophosphorylation, we will talk about an important term which is often used in um, context to non-cyclic photophosphorylation and that is the Z scheme. What is this Z scheme? You will often find it in your textbooks. So let me tell you what is this. Now throughout this process of non-cyclic photophosphorylation, what did we see? We saw that light falls on PS2, from PS2 electron gets excited, it is taken in by electron acceptor, it passes down the potential gradient through the electron transport chain, taken in by PS1, again it gets excited and is accepted by electron acceptor. This is how the movement of electron takes place. Now if you look at the path which the electron follows, it takes the shape of a Z, right? If you look at it from the other side, you will see it in the shape of a Z. And that is why it is known as Z scheme. So it is the scheme of transfer of electrons from PS2 through PS1, finally producing NADPH is known as Z scheme. Because after this step, NADPH is produced. So this entire process of transfer of electron, this entire system is known as the Z scheme because of the shape which it takes on the diagram. So this is known as the Z scheme of non-cyclic photophosphorylation. So I hope that the process of non-cyclic photophosphorylation is now clear. So the process started at PS2, it ended in PS1, so it is a non-cyclic process, it happens only in presence of light because if there is no light, then the electrons will not get excited and the process will not take place. Phosphorylation is adding phosphate. By the process of phosphorylation, only ATP is getting synthesized because if phosphate is not added to ADP, then ATP will not get produced. So that is why it is non-cyclic photophosphorylation. So I hope that the process is conceptually clear to you now. Okay. So as I said, the Z shape is formed when all electron carriers are placed in the correct sequence of redox potential scale. Okay, that is another important thing. You will get this shape only when you put all the electron carriers according to their potential scale. That is higher potential should be at the top, lower potential at the bottom. Only then the electron will move like this because the electron is moving down the potential scale. So if the electron carriers are in the right order, only then you will get it in this shape. So the final conclusion of non-cyclic photophosphorylation is, what do we get the, as the result of non-cyclic photophosphorylation? First is ATP. ATP is nothing but the energy currencies and they will be utilized for sugar synthesis in stroma. We get NADPH, they are also energy rich molecules. So these are energy rich molecules and they will be utilized in stroma for sugar synthesis. So this phase is known as the biosynthetic phase of photosynthesis. So that is the phase which we will talk the, about in the next section. So the process of sugar synthesis is known as biosynthetic phase. And the third product which is formed is oxygen and oxygen is the gas which is produced and this oxygen diffuses out of the chloroplast because it is right now produced in the chloroplast right near the thylakoids. So it diffuses out of chloroplast and this is produced as a byproduct of photosynthesis. So if you look at the overall equation of photosynthesis, you see oxygen is one of the products. Right? So one of the products of photosynthesis is already produced during the light reaction itself. Clear? So this is all about non-cyclic photophosphorylation. Now before we start talking about the biosynthetic phase or the sugar synthesis phase, 
let us quickly see what is cyclic photophosphorylation. Phosphorylation. How does the cyclic differs from the non-cyclic? Thank you. Please visit www.examfear.com to watch more videos, attempt free online test, get free study material, find tutors and mentors. Thank you once again.